Katie, really excited to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. My pleasure. So I, I always like to get things started with a little bit of family history, if you will. You grew up in Northwest Indiana, and when we spoke about your upbringing, the last time we got together, you mentioned a really unique choice that was given to you and your brother each year. Uh, it was a really fun story. So let's start there. What, what was that all about? Yeah. So growing up, my brother and I always got the choice of Disney or Vegas for our summer vacation. Um, you know, we spent most of the school year very heavily involved in sports. So when we got those summer breaks, you know, we always wanted to do something together. And um, I can honestly say that I was an actual like full adult before I ever went to, to Disney. <laughs> Every year we chose Vegas. So Vegas was the was the city of choice. And, and when we talked about this, I was thinking back because I've been to Vegas, you know, a handful of times as an adult. I never really I never really went as a kid, but I asked you why, why Vegas, like what was the draw? And you actually had quite a few reasons why and kind of fun adventures for kids. Go, go through those if you don't mind, because I didn't even know this, this existed. Well, first of all, start with, it was either like, you know, two or three days in Disney or two or three weeks in Vegas, because uh, we actually mm. had a lot of family out there. So not only was we, not only were we getting a family vacation, um, but my brother and myself didn't have to just hang out with each other. We had cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents that we got to go see and spend time with as well. So that was part of the draw was, you know, getting to see the rest of our family. But when I was growing up, actually Vegas was trying to be a family destination. So there were multiple theme parks at the casino. So MGM Grand had one. There was, um, Circus Circus opened the Adventure Dome. That's when all of the roller coasters started going in on like New York, New York and Stratosphere and Sahara, I believe even had one, but I don't think that one's there anymore. And then like just off the strip, there was a place called Fantasmic. And we frequented that place so often that uh, instead of closing down certain rides, they would actually let us clean up so that we could play again faster. <laughs> It was like a bumper car and you like shot Nerf balls at each other and they had to collect the Nerf balls so often. And we were there, like I said, so often they were like, the ha you faster we the get work. these cleaned up. Yeah. The faster <laughs> we get it cleaned up, the faster you can go again. So we're like, let us help. That's awesome. I was going to ask you, what is Funtasmic? Because in my notes, I had written down Funtasmic, like question mark, because I wasn't sure if, it, if I got that right or caught the name, but okay, got it. So go-karts, uh, Nerf. Okay, got it. All that. Yeah. Really cool. Arcade I, 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 games. I, yeah. No, Photo that's, booths. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. I never knew that uh, Las Vegas was so family friendly, at least at that time. Um, Wouldn't say that so much anymore. Um, yeah. Maybe not so much anymore, huh? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, we would do things off the strip too. So um, like Red Rock Canyon and Mount Charleston, we would go like hiking and things like that. So it wasn't just all about the strip, but I mean, there was, I mean, I think I called Excalibur my castle until I was well, let's be honest, it still is. <laughs> it still is. It still is. Um, well, you mentioned, you know, you touched on briefly that, uh, you know, growing up sports forward family, um, you actually found a lot of success as a youngster um, at camps and travel teams. I don't want to rush too far ahead because I think that's a really cool part of your story that, uh, you know, has obviously shaped who you are now as an adult. Um, maybe, maybe tell the listeners a little bit about that time on the road and kind of what those days were like with, uh, with such a sports heavy family. Yeah. So growing up, uh, like I said, during the school year, most weekends were spent, you know, in hotel rooms, traveling all throughout the Midwest, just playing different tournaments. So whether it's for myself or my brother, um, I fangirled super hard for my big brother when I was little, <laughs> uh, he, uh, kind of, you know, just, led the path for me to kind of follow in his footsteps in terms of like athletics and things like that. So uh, I made every tournament that I could, even when I was in high school. Um, I remember there would be games when I would play in the morning, my parents would then leave my game and we would all drive down two or three hours so that we can make it to his game by the evening. Cool. But tournaments were, you know, basically just excuses to hang out with all your best friends at the time. I mean, yeah. giant sleepovers, everyone in a hotel, you know, running yeah. all over the, you know, through the hallways, riding the luggage carts, whatever it may be. And you actually played basketball and volleyball. And when we have talked in the past about this, 
Um, more recently I asked, did you prefer volleyball or did you prefer basketball? Because you, a lot of the stories that you tell, you know, very basketball focused, but it sounds like you actually liked volleyball more. Is that right? I think so. Uh, I think volleyball was just that sport that I connected with a little bit more. Um, I was good at basketball. I'm six foot, so it's inevitable. Like the height goes a long way in athletics. Uh, so basketball was just something that came natural. Volleyball was that like more of a passion sport. So, you know, after graduation and even, you know, rec leagues and things like that, volleyball would is where I choose to play rather than basketball. In fact, I don't know that I've touched a basketball since I graduated. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that, that, uh, that journey of basketball, because you actually ended up at school, the, if I have this right, University of Nebraska at Omaha for basketball, not volleyball. Um, but what came after that decision was sort of a whirlwind wild ride from an injury perspective, which I think you would probably agree has taught you a lot about many things as you now are in your professional career, but let's, um, maybe back up for a second, um, uh, before we get to the exciting bits of that story. Um, you said that as you were in high school, one school ended up standing out, which ended up being this school. Um, but there's a story around like 9 PM would hit and something would happen. Walk us through what that time period was like for you as, as a youngster. Yeah. So again, this kind of dates me, I guess, uh, cause this was back when, uh, nights and weekends were free for cell phones. So all your recruiters would wait till 9 p.m. to hit before they'd start to call you to talk about, you know, setting up a visit or, you know, potentially coming to their school on a scholarship. And I, it got to the point where, you know, I, I really didn't want to grow up as a kid. I lived my best life in high school and didn't know all the opportunities that were going to be like placed in front of me by going to UNO. And so it would get to the point where I would leave my cell phone at home. You know, the one thing that most kids have attached to them at all times, I was like, I don't want to talk to these recruiters. It's my Friday night at nine o'clock. Like I'm not going to spend it on the phone talking to a basketball coach. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, ultimately though, uh, you know, my mom convinced me to start answering these calls because it was pretty important to my future. And uh, I was offered a full ride and actually it was the assistant coach, Jason Flores, that, you know, really made an impression on me and kind of, you know, in, impressed me in a way with his persistence and his knowledge of who I was as an athlete and, you know, where my strengths lied and the improvements that they had kind of already laid out to make me a better athlete. Mm. Let's talk about that journey. So something happens like <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Literally every single year, freshman sophomore, junior, senior year. It's like, you know, I, I feel like you probably think the same thing. It's sort of comical, maybe looking back, although I'm sure in the moment it was not comical at all and, and not to, you know, lessen the impact that this probably had on you physically and psychologically, but, but tell us about the kind of the succession of these crazy stories that happened each year while you were there. Yeah. So my freshman year, everything's going great. You know, other than the fact that I just moved, you know, However, eight hours from home, I'm by myself, you know, mm. for the first time, but we get into the season, going to school and being an athlete has its benefits because you already have a built-in family when you get there. All of your teammates already know your name. You're going to have someone to hang out with at all times. So that was the added benefit of being part of it. What I didn't expect was um, the, the illness that hit me my freshman year. I don't know if it was a combination of the stress of starting a season when a new school year in a new location all by myself, mm. but, um, it took me down for account for a few weeks. And, you know, I went to a couple different doctors and like, it wasn't like a strep or a pneumonia or, you know, anything like that. And I just, I couldn't breathe. Ultimately it, it uh, uh, it breathe or swallow, I should say, cause it was my tonsils. So oh. eventually had to, my tonsils taken out, which cured that because it had come back quite a few times, like year after year at the same kind of point. Mm -hmm. So fix that by having my tonsils taken out. So there's one surgery. All right. We got that taken care of. Yep. Yep. That's over. Oh, we're, we're ready to go now. Right. Year two rolls around. Um, I've got a little bit of spare time. So my roommate got me a, uh, a part-time job working at a golf course. Um, I was the beverage cart driver on my way home from nice. first day on the job, you know, all my tips in my pocket, car accident. 
Mm. concussion, no serious injuries, but uh, the concussion took me out right at the end of conditioning. So we made the decision to redshirt me that year. So ultimately what I believe probably would have been my most successful season uh, in terms of just like my skill and ability and, you know, how the year had gone. Um, hindsight's 2020. So, oh man, yeah. Sat me for that year. So yeah. now I still have three years of eligibility left. Okay. Great. I'm, we're keeping track. Yep. Year three. Um, we're mostly through the season, having, you know, pretty good go at it. And uh, we're doing a shoot around before we're getting ready to leave for a game, go up for a rebound, come down, sit down, scoot off the court, let the rest of the team play a uh, partial tear to my ACL. Oof. So with the partial tear, we decided to um, write it out. No, no surgery, just a little bit of physical therapy. Um, and then that season, I actually ended up playing uh, a semester of volleyball at UNO, which was really cool experience for me because oh. it, you know, was kind of one of my passions. Uh, then leading into my fourth year um, is when I completely tore that ACL. So that took me out mm. the entire season that year. And let's wrap up the fifth year with another meniscus tear. <laughs> That's really tough. I, um, I feel you on that because I tore my ACL about four years ago. It's actually fun, fun fact. That's sort of where I started, um, figuring out how to do podcasting. I decided to do a podcast for every stage of the recovery process of the ACL tear surgery recovery and subsequent um, activities after that. But I feel you, the ACL is, is really tough. And, um, I think, as I said earlier, you know, physically, but also mentally, I think that must've been sort of a mentally draining time for you to sort of go through all of those subsequent injuries. And then kind of ice down the cake is ACL and torn meniscus, um, back to back years. That's, that's tough. You know, um, looking back at it, I think, Oh, so much came out of it in terms of, you know, like my career path, because even though I couldn't play, I was still very much part of the team. So I was able to help coach in a, in a sense. So mm. I'm sitting on the bench every game, you know, as my teammates are coming out, I'm pointing out things that they may not have been able to see while they were in the game, or, you know, I'm calling out plays or, you know, different things that like shooters that are coming on the other team, because we had our scouting reports and everything like that. So where the coaching kind of then turned into the training that I get to do, you know, in my career every day, I think had a, you know, a nice correlation. Yeah. And, and I don't want to rush through this part because I think it, it, um, it does help set the stage for where we're going to pivot into next, but you went to school and you kind of focused on PR journalism, marketing, um, the program over there, and you were able to, to, uh, find yourself involved in the PRSA group, which is a national organization. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, you know, look it up. It's really cool. Um, but you ended up going to Washington DC, if I recall correctly, and you were able to sort of present nationally as a group. Um, and you said to me that, th that you really feel like in retrospect, that's what sort of started to help set you up for what you're doing today. Um, before we pivot into your career at Hills, um, maybe set the stage a little bit more, set the table for that. Like, why do you, uh, why do you feel that way? Or what, what stands out for you looking back, um, with regards to helping you get set up for what you're doing today. Yeah. So um, not only was I a member of the PRSSA, the Public Relations Student Society of America, um, I was the president of the PR firm on site at UNO. Mm. So there was different aspects of that where we had actual paying clients who came to us for full ad sets. Um, they'd, we'd get full kits for them. We designed logos, set up their social media. Um, and then the PRSSA part of it was um, the national presentations and just um, the submitting all of our the work that we do in the firm for the word, awards and recognition for our hard work throughout the year. And I mean, so much of that has correlated to what has become important to me in highlighting in terms of what I do on a daily basis at Hills. Mm. Um, but getting my foot in the door there, you know, um, really helped me shake out some of the nerves that can kind of come with the public speaking and, you know, being in front of a large stage. And, um, you know, I had a great team that I relied on there just like I do now and having the opportunity to lead a team 
you know, just gives you more insight to all the things that everyone's capable of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously some correlation here too, between your, your time with the, the, the basketball team and sort of being mm-hmm. with the group and, and having kind of forced into a leadership role, uh, to some extent for an extended period of time. And obviously the work on the marketing side, that's really cool. Let's pivot into your career at Hills and, um, kind of a funny story is, is it, it started really after moving back in with your brother. And so you kind of full circle now back with the family, um, back to Indiana. What were you doing those first, uh, those first few months trying to kind of figure it out, I guess, more or less. Uh, uh, trying to avoid it at all costs really (laughs) is what I was doing. Um, I moved back home and was working retail, um, living with my brother, probably mooching a little more than I should have, um, to the point where he came home. He was like, so how's the job hunt going? I was like, I have a job. He's like, how's the job hunt going? So Mm, point taken. (laughs) I got it. Um, and you know, fortunately enough, um, his wife, my sister-in-law was working for Hills at the time. And, um, she saw that I could potentially be a good fit at that time. You know, I had lived, I've known Lauren for a long time, but you know, she had never seen like my work ethic in terms of like what I could do professionally. So she put her neck out on the line for me. And it's, you know, something that I'll never forget because, you know, she ultimately put me in the right place to kind of just skyrocket with my career. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you go in as a kid fresh out of college thinking like, oh yeah, I need, I need an adult job, you know, not thinking that what almost 11 years later, I've built a full career out of it. Yeah, that's really cool. And and you started and we'll kind of get into this um, speaking to your career path, but you started with sort of this regional manager role. And I, I'm sorry if this, uh, I don't want to reduce this by any means, but I, I always think of the office whenever I hear <laughs> regional manager and like the, the battles that, that Dwight and Jim would have over the regional manager position. So I just have to say that out loud. Cause I think it's, it's fun. So I was never actually a regional manager. My first interview was with the regional manager. Okay. Yep. yep. So, um, I started as a leasing consultant, but instead of meeting with the property managers in the area, because there wasn't any open positions, they're like, just meet with the regional so that we can get a feel of whether or not we want to kind of, I hate to make the sports reference, but like keep you on our bench so that, you know, mm. when it comes time to pull you in the game, you know, we know whether or not you're going to be able to fill the role. Yeah. And you said back then it was like a completely different world. Like, Oh um, yeah. Like from an ownership perspective, like, you know, it didn't really matter what you did. You said like, if you kind of messed up, your boss would take care of it. Um, and, um, I guess talk to us about that, like different world, different times. Um, how has that changed looking back? Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think that people look at a leasing consultant title completely different now. Um, Personally, when I was a leasing consultant, I, I literally, you know, showed apartments. That was the extent mm-hmm. of it. I, I unlocked a door and I told the same joke every time I got to the closet. I mean, it was inevitable, the same joke over and over again. Um, it wasn't what I, you know, what we teach our current leasing consultants to do, the expectation and, you know, just how we cross train them more and, and give them more tools to really see it as a career, not just another job. And I think that mm-hmm. kind of goes with, you know, creating that that retention in terms of associates um, to let them know that we're going to do everything we can to get them where they want to be and, um, you know, give them every opportunity to grow within the company. Yeah. We're, we're essentially on our way to your current role, which is customer experience and training manager. But before we get there, because I really want to dig into that on this podcast, Um, there came a moment in time while you were kind of rising in the ranks at Hills where you were, you were interviewed for a promotion and a really important promotion to you at the time. I mean, you were really excited about it. Um, you were energized, um, but you ended up not getting it as much, as much as you felt like it was a perfect fit. Like talk us through that lead up and then, you know, understandable disappointment and, um, you know, how did that, how did that leave you feeling at that time in your, in your career journey? Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the interview process, I came out of it, you know, so confident, just knowing that 
the property that I was at and the promotion I was going for, you know, is what I had been doing for the last two years. I, I mean, I know every resident's kids, pets, you know, name, address. Mm. And so when the opportunity came up, I was like, this is it. This is the perfect fit. This is my next step. And this is, you know, how I'll grow within the company. Uh, and then it was uh, a few days later when I was told that, you know, this isn't the right fit. We're actually going to go with somebody else, um, potentially someone even outside the company. And um, when we do, we're going to need you to help train them. And in my mind, that just, I, it just didn't make sense to me then. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, you know, looking back at it now, I get it. It's they weren't asking me to train to person to do their role. They were asking me to teach them the Hills way, which is something yeah. that I, you know, live and breathe every day. So it wasn't necessarily that I was training them for their position. I was training them on our company and our core values and, you know, our expectations at that time. Did I see it that way? Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I, I wanted a promotion and now I'm training the person that got it, not me. Mm hmm. Hindsight's 2020, right? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. You know, um, and it wasn't until uh, someone on the leadership team came to me and explained why I didn't get it that everything made more sense. Um, that wasn't the path that they had seen for me in terms of like where I could grow within the company. And they almost felt like putting me in that position would have um, taken, taken away my spark because it would have yeah. been more in administrative and, um, less to do with, you know, the things that really get me fired up on a daily basis. So yeah. once I understood their path for me, there was no stopping me. And let's talk about that path. So you were, um, basic, I, I don't want to say transferred because that's not the right term, but you were, you were relocated to mm -hmm. Louisville and you ended up living there for almost a year. You were working with two different properties. Um, and then you kind of like, check the boxes of, of different roles, sort of, again, on your way up in the Hills stratosphere, what were those roles kind of leading into the, the current role of customer experience and training manager? Yeah. So I left Indy, a leasing consultant and went to one of our properties down in Louisville, um, almost laterally as a leasing consultant. Um, but in our company, we all considered it as a somewhat promotion because it was going from a, an established community to a lease up. So yeah. very drastic, different responsibilities in terms of, you know, leasing these buildings and planning the uh, move-ins for, you know, 12 move-ins in a day and, you know, making those coordinate and flow seamlessly. So even though the title change wasn't there, the experiences definitely were what I would consider promotion worthy. Yeah. And then um, from the property I was at, I received another promotion to leasing director at another brand new um, lease up. So, you know, uh, leasing trailer on a pile of dirt and, you know, your samples. Yeah. So you're pointing to that pile of dirt and you're like, your future <laughs> home is going to be there and it's going to be stunning. Yeah. Right now, just use your imagination. Mm -hmm. So you were, you became leasing director, you mm -hmm ended up becoming a marketing coordinator and then kind of an assistant, assistant marketing director as well. And it's at that moment or at that time that, um, this new role was essentially created for you, right? Like you, it was clear what your path was at Hills. Um, there came this new opportunity for you to more or less, um, create your own role. And that role is called customer experience and training manager. And I really want to dig into this position because it's something that either listeners haven't heard of yet and or don't really understand what it is, but it's clearly becoming more important across the multifamily industry. And so I, I would love it if you would give the listeners a breakdown of how you would describe what that is kind of on a on a day to day basis. Yeah. So day to day basis, like we know in this industry, it's not, never the same. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, my I mean, my responsibilities stretch from, you know construction to lease up to established communities and everything in terms of um, decorating, training, social media, uh, development, floor plans, you know, it's looking at blueprints and making sure that there's linen closets in all the bathrooms. And if there's not linen closets, it's, 
um, do we add extra shelvings? It's those little details that may get missed in paying attention at why what we do creates that little bit of an extra experience to take, you know, it from being transactional to, you know, an experience at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it truly, from your description of it to me, it truly seems like it's, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. You know, there's the customer experience side and there's the training manager side. Customer experience is literally, I think you're, you actually quoted to me something to the effect of just like, how can I make your day better? Big changes, little changes. Um, is someone struggling with something? Can I still step in? Can I help out? Um, you know, and it, and you, you kind of mentioned, it's not just one person or one team. It's, it's really, it's really everyone. Like how can you touch everyone from the management side to the associate side, to the people living in the building? Um, and then on the training side, you know, you're really speaking to like observing phone calls, uh, better training your, up your staff and, and being almost like the omnipresent Katie Kane awareness, like the lightning bolt who like sees, sees everything and is able to kind of connect the dots uh, across the, the landscape, if you will. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I say customer experience, well, my first customer are my associates. I need them to be happy and enjoy what they're doing in order to provide that experience that our customers and residents are going to resonate with. So like you said, going in there and just saying like, if I could change one thing about your day to make it mildly better, whether it's, you know, big or small, you know, throw it at me and let's see what we could do with it. You know, sometimes mm. it's like, well, I want a sauna put in the back room, you know, like, I don't know <laughs> what it may be, yeah. but it's like, okay, clearly we can't make that happen, but it's like, okay, so now when it comes time for rewards, maybe, maybe we reward this associate with a spa gift card. And it's like, so taking their right. recommendations and just remembering who, who each team member is individually and really focusing on how that individual really impacts how we do business and how our customers see us and how our competitors see us because you want to set yourself apart and you want to sit above the rest. So making mm. sure that those associates are, you know, valued and they feel it really is where I think, you know, having a customer experience role needs to start. Can you speak to the rarity of this role in the industry and, and also perhaps um, why you feel like this position is so important for real estate groups to consider, you know, moving forward 2022 and beyond? Yeah. So um, I've actually seen it quite a bit more, um, even more so, I think, on the vendor side, um, because they are looking to create that better customer experience and having a specific liaison to connect the customer with the company, I think is really where I and anyone in this position can bridge the gap. It's having somebody that's had both sides of the experience so that when someone comes and says to me, like, this is what I need, I could see it from the leadership side and I could see it from the onsite side. So it's, you know, it's, it's a constant balancing act of making sure that, you know, we're meeting goals in the right way, but also making sure that I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. So having having the experience that'll put me from the leadership time leadership side as well as the leasing side, um, mm. make sure that we are successful in completing those goals. Um, and there's that constant balance of making sure that we've you know checked all the boxes. Yeah. And I think too, you, you were mentioning to me how it kind of harkens back to, and maybe you could even reference back to some of the injuries that you had in, in college and how that correlates to this role, a role that is, it's new, it's different. It's not necessarily something that's been, you know, there's not like a clear path that's been blazed ahead of you by, you know, mentor after mentor or decades after decades of this type of role in the industry. So I don't know, maybe, um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but maybe you could speak to, you know, some of that correlation back to those days of, of, of injury and, and kind of recovery and rehab. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things I think that people get comfortable and then they don't look at the opportunities that are set in front of them. 
And so Mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, just because things work doesn't mean they're performing at their peak. So for example, I recently, again, this is past college and all those surgeries and injuries. Um, Mm -hmm. I recently tore my ACL again, uh, the other knee actually. And Mm -hmm. because I had gone through it, I I knew it was torn. Um, But I went to the doctor and they told me that, you know, everything seemed like it was fine. Like everything in my leg was very strong. So I should be able to go about my day to day. And I did for a about nine months before I oh. got a bucket handle tear in my medial meniscus, which uh, was by far the worst recovery I've ever gone through. And, you know, I sit there and I look back and I was like, had I got a second opinion and didn't just trust the one doctor that said like, oh, you'll be fine. Like maybe I could have fixed that meniscus and then I wouldn't be going through what I'm going through now. Mm-hmm. I feel like we do that, you know, in our professional careers too. It's like, well, you know, we've been doing it this way for so long and it works just fine. How long is it till fine's not good enough anymore? And you almost find yourself scrambling when you've kind of gotten stuck in that routine. And now you've got to figure out what the next step is rather than being proactive and, you know, maybe taking a little bit more risks or getting that second opinion on how you could have changed something to make your day-to-day just a little bit easier. Yeah. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And and clearly to, I would love to speak about Hills a little bit and just kind of better understand um, Hills properties, but it seems like they they understand that, or at least they understand that need for a new way of thinking. Um, At the very least, obviously they're open to seeing that through with you and your role today. What, What do you feel like sets apart hills from others in the industry that you can that you can think of off the top of your head that's maybe worth referencing kind of in relation to this conversation around kind of breaking new ground and and being open to change uh well this isn't exactly play to the being open to change part but um everyone on our leadership team started in an entry-level position with hills so i mean the tenure that's on our team is in the hundreds of years of experience specifically Mm -hmm. with Hills. So, you know, where we've got that tenure with associates who know, love, breathe, bleed our core values. We also have the, the sight to see that, you know, because we, you know, I've been here for 10 years, doesn't mean that what I was doing 10 years ago is going to work today. Or, I mean, I think some, one of our, um, district managers just celebrated her 29th anniversary with Hills. So, wow. you know, knowing that we've got this experience of leadership that's been on site and in the trenches and, you know, in on the leadership team, but still relies on all of those new resources that are out there and are constantly given the opportunities, myself included the opportunities to get to these conferences and see what's out there and ways to improve us just speaks to what Hills is doing to a put um, time and energy into its associates, but as well as the company itself. And it seems too like Hills, you know, being, being sort of family, family owned and operated. um, It seems like there's a, you know, kind of like this small town intangible part of it vibe where it, it, from our conversations, it seems like everyone knows everyone, you know, people are, people know you by your first name. They kind of ask you how the weekend was. And, you know, I know that you travel around to different, uh, different cities and, and, and still like the team is able to, um, check in, be present, understand what's going on. And obviously a big part of your job is, is doing the same in return. Um, one, th- one other thing I wanted to touch on with Hills that we talked about before, um, really had to do with like, um, wellness programs, um, financial, physical, mental, um, and social, um, impacts quarterly, like not something that maybe comes up in a meeting once. And then three years later it's revisited, but those types of things are actually topics that come up quite often, uh, as, as, as check-ins or, or touch-in points for you on the Hills team. Talk about that a little bit before we, uh, transition. Cause I'd love to hear more about just how that works. Yeah. So um, a few years ago, me and um, someone from our HR team put together this wellness initiative. Um, We called it HERO, uh, Helping Empower Real Opportunities. 
And like you said, we divided the year quarterly. So financial, emotional, physical, and social wellness. And each quarter, we kind of focus on what we've designated that for. So we did financial for the beginning of the year to help people who are recovering from the holidays and like, you know, get back on their feet after, you know, maybe we spent a little spoiling our, you know, Mm. loved ones. Um, We end the year with the social wellness and just, you know, like, because you're going to have all those gatherings at the end of the year and, you know, just making sure that we've, you know, that we let people know that it's okay that if your social cup is empty, like, and you need to take that step back, that is okay, too. And we try to fill the gaps in between with the physical and the emotional. Um, We've provided opportunities to give back to the communities that we serve. That is something that I will say has been our biggest focus these last few years, Mm -hmm. whether it's, um, in fact, today, a group of uh, our associates were out building a house for Habitat for Humanity. And another group of associates were packing lunches or um, food for them to take to high school or elementary schools for the kids to take home so their families have meals for the weekend. Mm. And yeah. that's that was just today. So, you know, having those opportunities to enrich our associates, you know, lives on the clock. So they're getting paid for that and they're getting the chance to give back and just filling their hearts with, you know, the joy to know that they've helped somebody else. Um, I think, you know, really serves us and comes back tenfold in terms of like our uh, employees' performances and just the overall love of their job. Yeah. And in in a time or in an era when data and KPIs and so forth are so widely recognized as being sort of this end-all be-all, we hear about it all the times, you know, it it seems like Hills understands the value of looking beyond those uh, because it does impact the team members in a way that you can't necessarily um, grade or rank or get data from outside of maybe they stay in their careers Mm -hmm. quite a bit longer with Hills. And it sounds like that's the case um, with a lot of the, the team members around you, which is really cool. Yeah. It's been something that, you know, we reach out to them too. And we ask like for, causes that they that are close to them. So it's not just the leadership team, it's everybody on site. We 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 set the stage for them with the hero initiative and we've allowed them to just kind of run with it. So a lot of them have given back to their local schools where they've, you know, helped paint classrooms in the summer or, you know, packed a school bus with um, school supplies and, you know, food drives and things for animal mm. shelters. And it's not just resident events, it's our associates getting back and getting involved themselves because it's something that they're truly passionate about. Yeah. Let's, um, as we start to wrap up, let's talk about Katie Kane version 2.0 in the 2020s. So we're in 2022 version 2.0 looking ahead. Um, who, who is that person? Like, what do you, what kind of gets you, um, what ignites that fire? Like, what are you looking forward to, um, about your position and, and your role moving forward? Yeah. So, I mean, if we start at 2020, let's be honest, um, (laughs) the year didn't go how anyone planned, but selfishly, it was great. Um, I was dealing with another one of those surgeries. And so I was homebound anyways, I couldn't leave if I wanted to. And so it really played into, you know, my FOMO is my fear of missing out with everyone else out doing, you know, all the fun activities, but then everyone got stuck at home just like me. So um, 2020 actually started out a pretty high note for myself, I'll say. Um, and you say Katie 2.0, you know, I've got had knee surgery, hip surgeries, I, I'm about a new person as it is. I just had another new- like- Maybe we're at about 5.0 at this point. It, right. Yeah. I had a <laughs> surgery number four uh, just two weeks ago on the other knee. So, you know, full circle, we're back to where we started. Um, but, you know, for the rest of the year, um, we've got so many new projects coming up that, you know, we're really excited about. And, you know, just really putting myself out there and pushing myself to an almost uncomfortable level, because, you know, like I said, we all kind of settle where, you know, where we're used to. And uh, to really kind of push the envelope and look for the next new thing before before anyone knows what it is. Mm. Maybe I'm the next new thing. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe that's who Katie two five point oh is, right? Katie Katie um, five point two. Right. <laughs> um, but I 
you know, there's just so many opportunities and there's so many new products and everything that's just coming up in the future is, you know, your, your inbox gets bombarded with all types of um, opportunities and new products. And maybe, maybe I start to pay attention to a couple more of those instead yeah. of just assuming that I've already got all the boxes checked. Yeah. Well, I have my cheat sheet here in front of me. And one of my last questions was going to be really what you're looking out for in the industry. And a few of the things, a few of the topic areas that you wanted to hit on was, um, you know, kind of market change and kind of the ebbs and flows of the, the cyclical real estate market at large, um, meeting the renter where they want to be met, meeting residents where they want to be met, and this kind of topic of centralized leasing. So not to like spoil the spoil the list, so to speak, but uh, more sort of refresh your memory. I'd love to, love to get your kind of quick hit thoughts on what are you looking out for in um, like market changes, for example, right now? Yeah. So again, it comes to in with our product in our markets right now, almost exclusively working off of a wait list. So mm. our, our next big thing is when is that, that floor going to drop? So, and how do we prepare our teams to be ready to lease again. Right now, we've been really focused on selling the waitlist and a product that could potentially come available. It's almost like, you know, leasing that pile of dirt again. We don't have anything to show you, but mm. maybe if you get on this waitlist, we'll have what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, so it's making sure that they're set up for success when we do have actual um, homes coming on the market um, because it's gonna happen at any moment. We're all yeah. just holding and our breath. Yeah. And, and how about this idea of meeting the renter or the residents where they want to be met? Like, what are you, what are you thinking about or maybe even preparing for on those fronts? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the virtual things that came up over the course of the past few years. So, you know, me being the customer experience person that I am, I used to think if they're not there in person, they're not getting the experience that they deserve. Maybe that's not the experience that they want. Maybe they want to be able to do it virtually. They don't want to have to leave their home. They want to be able to get the full experience of seeing the product, the floor plan, the amenities from the comfort of their couch. Um, but having the opportunity to FaceTime with an associate and get their questions answered in real time, you know, while they've watched the video or after they've watched the video, or maybe they're watching it mm -hmm. together. Maybe the associate's walking them through the floor plan, you know, over a call some, similar to what we're doing now. Um, but you've got to figure out where they want to be and how they want to be leased to. Because yeah. if we just assume what we're doing is working, I mean, full circle, come, came back to it again. <laughs> we're just going to end up scrambling in the end. Yeah. Well, in, in speaking of leasing, let's let's touch on centralized leasing before we wrap up. Um, what are your, it's such a buzzword right now, but what are your thoughts on centralized leasing? Like where, where do you stand or where does Hills stand with with that topic at the moment? Uh, at the moment, it's not on our radar. I mean, it's always on our radar, but it's not something that we have considered doing yet. Um, I do think that there are opportunities in terms of centralized leasing. Um, and I also feel like there's a lot of different definitions of it. You know, I've heard multiple different things where it's one location and there's no onsite team. I've heard where the centralized location takes all of the inbound calls, but yet the onsite team is still there to take care of residents. So it's, you know, finding the right fit for you and your team. And, you know, honestly, it could be something that we move to in the future, just, you know, not where we're at right now. Yeah. All right. Let's jump into rapid fire. One of my favorite parts of the podcast, just because it kind of puts you on the spot a little bit. And I love, I love some of the responses. My first question is what do you feel like is the most sought after moment customer experience wise as a renter? Uh, okay, so as a renter, um, that customer experience really, really comes into play when the specialist or leasing consultant can solve a problem you didn't know you have. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can think of a time when I was on a tour and I I was doing everything I could to figure out this, uh, uh, this prospect's hot buttons. Like I wanted to know what they were looking for in their home. And it was one of those things where he's like, I just need some place to sleep. And, and so then I asked them, what shift do you work? Do you need evening sun, morning sun? Like where I want to make mm. sure that if you're coming home at first thing in the morning, that your bedroom window isn't getting that morning sun so that you can go home and go to bed. And just that like light bulb moment where he's like, no one 
and all of the communities I've been to have thought to ask me that question. Mm, and yeah. that I, it was something that was could that was important to me, but I didn't know it was important to me until you said it just that moment. Yeah, so that's fascinating. Yeah, it's it's those little things that really paying attention to who your prospect is and not just accepting no for an answer. I mean, at some point, yes, it's, it's actually it's knowing how to ask the right questions. I love that. Yeah, that's a and that's a great example too of really understanding and it kind of ties back to meeting the in this case the potential renter where they want to be met they want to be understood they want to be heard that's great all right one book that you would recommend right now and why okay um i actually have one the one i want to talk about right here <laughs> okay. Let's talk about um it. okay so it's the experience maker obviously goes right along with what i'm mo most passionate about um and i'm actually about to start it over um because the virgo in me wouldn't let me write in it so I, I just got some transparent post-it notes that I can now <laughs> use in my book to take all the notes and, you know, mark the sections that are important and that I want to kind of take and put the hill spin on it and then add it to my two-day training course that I use. So mm. um, there's so many, you know, different examples from all different industries in terms of creating a resident experience and, you know, how to be witty and how witty doesn't necessarily mean funny, but it, you know, it's just thinking outside the box or sometimes thinking inside the box. Sometimes we think we push it too far um, and you just need to reel it in just a little bit. And um, ultimately the the re results are quite um, unexpected. That will be in the show notes. So we have a pretty extensive show notes list here. So you'll, you'll be able to connect with Hills and Katie in, um, on all social platforms and we'll, we'll be sure to have a link to the book in the show notes for this episode as well. Um, Katie, thanks so much for joining me today. There's really just one more thing to do and that is to roll the giant red carpet out for you and ask you, where can the world find you online? What are you up to? Give them all the details they need to know what you're up to and where they can, uh, reach out if they would like. Yeah. So, um, find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm always looking for new connections there. Uh, I love participating and answering your questions and, you know, I, the polls that are out on LinkedIn right now, man, they, uh, the, the entire industry is killing the game right now. And I just find it so fascinating with some of the, you know, responses that are out there. Um, so I'm very active on LinkedIn and I would love to connect with all of you. Um, you can find me on Instagram as well. Um, and then as for me, like I, I'm just taking it day by day and trying to, you know, like I said, push myself outside that comfort zone and find out what's next. And heal up a little bit. Let's get you some and, and healed. Yeah. healthy heading into 2023. Okay. Uh, well, Katie, thanks again for joining me today. It's been a, it's been a blast hearing your story and, uh, and diving in here. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.